Hello, hello everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to another installment of our visiting lecture series here in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Macau. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Greg Moss. Professor Moss is an associate professor of philosophy at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He was once a Fulbright's research fellowship scholar under Marcus Gabriel at the University of Bonn, has since moved to this part of the world to join us as one of our philosophical neighbors, I suppose. Professor Moss has expertise in some very wide ranging areas, systematic metaphysical and epistemological investigations stemming from the post-Kantian ancient Greek philosophical traditions. In addition, Professor Moss has done some work in philosophical logic from Hegelian points of view, dialectic points of view, a so very impressive and wide range of expertise. Today, Professor Moss is going to speak to us about some work which currently goes by the title Ernst Kassir and the Place of Myth in Scientific Culture. Just a few procedural points before I hand things over. As always, Professor Moss will speak for anywhere between 50 to 60 minutes or so, after which the floor will open to Q&A for those who wish to ask questions or offer comments. Later on downstairs, we will have reception at the Fort Club, as you're aware. And so with that, before I finally hand things over, I would love if you all joined me in welcoming Professor Moss. Okay, uh, thanks so much for the warm introduction, uh, Ben. And can everyone hear me okay? That's good. All right. Just wanted to check. Can you check the people online? Can you hear us? Okay. Can y'all hear us? Okay, so I'm from the South, the Southern US, so I say y'all. And uh, so I hope, I hope it's okay if I speak in my own idiom here today. Um, I didn't realize this was the Department of Philosophy and Religion. So it's a nice coincidence that I'll speak about myth, uh, which is religion adjacent, even uh, if according to Kassir, it, it isn't the same thing as religion. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. So thanks so much for the invitation. Just a couple comments before I get started and then I will, I will read a paper the old way. So there's no PowerPoint, there's nothing to look at. You just have to listen. Um, so this is a part of the final chapter of a book that I'm writing on Kassir, Schelling, and the philosophy of mythology. And it's uh, from the later part of the book. Uh, and so it does require a lot of um, reading ahead of time. So I've uh, tr made an effort to make it somewhat accessible uh, despite that placement. Um, it is a draft right now. It's, it's under review with some publishers. So if you have any comments, I'd, uh, I'd love to hear them uh, to help me improve the draft and uh, uh, I'll be happily to put your name in a footnote. <laughs> okay, so just uh, looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, okay, with that said, uh, let's get started. Okay, Ernst Kassir's transcendental approach to myth. In order to articulate the conflict between myth and science in Kassir's philosophy, we should first elucidate the meaning of myth in his philosophy. Kassir's philosophy of mythology begins from a recognition of the facts of mythical consciousness, one of which is the practice and belief in magic. Given that there are such magical facts, Kassir asks a transcendental question about magic. Given the practice and belief in magic in mythical culture, what is the condition for the possibility of that fact? Kassir argues that the facts of mythical culture can only be accounted for by the law, quoting Kassir, of the concrescence or coincidence of the members of a relation. Kassir has a thoroughly symbolic view of culture in general. Accordingly, Kassir expresses the law of mythical consciousness in a symbolic articulation defined by the law of the equivalence of the relata. Given that all symbolic representation is constituted by a relation between sign and signified, Mythical culture is defined by the law of the equivalence of sign and signify. Quoting Kassir, at first the world of language, like that of myth, in which it seems as it were embedded, preserves a complete equivalence of word and thing, 
signifier, and signified. This equivalence of sign and signified is for Kassir a transcendental condition of one of the distinguishing features of mythical culture, magic. Given that the human being has the capacity to manipulate the sign and the sign is not distinguished from the thing signified, the human being believes they can manipulate the thing signified by manipulating the signs alone. Indeed, this is magic, the belief in one's capacity to manipulate things by the use of signs. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That does not apply in the magical world. For the mythical view of language, the word sign is identical to the thing that it signifies. Hence, one can manipulate a thing by manipulating the name that denotes it. The following Egyptian legend illustrates this well. Whoever knows the name of a god or a demon has unlimited power over the bearer of the name. An Egyptian legend tells how Isis, the great enchantress, tricked the sun god Ra into revealing his name to her and how she thus obtained dominion over him and all the other gods. Ernst Kassir's transcendental critique of mythical consciousness provides powerful explanation of the magical dimension of mythical culture. By manipulating the sign, the magician attempts to manipulate the signified. For example, by manipulating the image of a person, the Tuvan magician aims to manipulate the person himself. Balgan, a local Tuvan shaman, reports that he can perform love magic and magically manipulate a person by staring at a photo of them. Such forms of image magic are employed not only as a way to regain the love of a former spouse, but also to exact revenge for past wrongs. Without the equivalence of sign and signified, Kassir argues, the manipulation of the sign cannot ensure a transformation of what is signified. Accordingly, Kassir's law of mythical consciousness is aimed to account for the very possibility of magical belief and magical practice. We can talk about other examples if we want later, but I'll leave that alone for now. In addition to its commitment to magic, mythical culture divides the world into the sacred and profane regions. For mythical consciousness, the sacred transcends the profane, the ordinary. As such, the sacred is extraordinary. And insofar as the sacred appears as extraordinary, it appears as something which cannot be integrated into profane existence. Accordingly, by encountering the sacred, one encounters that which cannot be integrated into the ordinary course of experience. As a result, the sacred appears as something incomparable with the world and its objects, as something unique. Kassir writes that, quote, each object that engages and fills the mythical consciousness pertains, as it were, only to itself. It is incomparable and unique. Because the sacred is experienced as transcending the common empirical world, the sacred cannot be understood on the model of those objects in that world. Mythical consciousness has the sacred only insofar as it is overpowered by it, such that in the sacred experience, myth lives in the immediate impression, which it accepts without measuring it by something else, close quote. Because it transcends any available model of understanding, Kassir argues that the sacred has its origin in the experience of astonishment, Thalmazidane. Just as science and philosophy begins in wonder, myth does too. Kassir emphasizes again and again the primary role of feeling. Quote, only those individual impressions, which because of their special intensity and force, stand out from the common background, are separated out from this indeterminacy of feeling, close quote. All thought and perception in mythical culture rests on an original foundation of feeling, such that things only exist for the self if they affect it emotionally. An astonishment the sacred transcends the profane. Quoting Kassira, this distinctive feature of transcendence always connects all the contents of mythical and religious consciousness with one another. One cannot catalog a priori and in advance of human experience the kinds of objects and relations that will astonish human beings. In order to uncover the objects of astonishment, one must consult human experience and the empirical ethnological study of culture. Because the sacred is set apart from the ordinary as an object of astonishment, and anything can be an object of astonishment, the sacred is not a property of any particular kind of thing. Regarding myth, Kassir claims that, quote, it designates a certain ideal relatedness rather than a certain objective constitution. The ideal relation here appears to be emotional in content. It signifies an emotional relationship that confers sacred being. As long as it captures the mythical interest, it can constitute sacred being. The difference between the sacred and the profane is qualitative, such that particular values are inserted into reality originally devoid of them, such that myth divides the world into mythically significant and mythically irrelevant sphere. Quoting Kassira, 
every mythically significant content, every living relationship that is raised out of the sphere of the indifferent and in everyday forms is, as it were, its own ring of existence and enclosed and cared for region of being that is separated from its surroundings by fixed barriers. And only in this separation does it achieve its own individual religious shape, the shtat. Kassir's account of the origin of the sacred and the profane is not merely a theoretical construct, but also throws light on phenomena illuminated by empirical research, such as the empirical research on the concept of mana. Kassir finds his theory of the origin of the sacred confirmed in the phenomena of mana, a topic which was of great interest to philosophers and anthropologists in the first half of the 20th century. Mana is first introduced by Cordington, an anthropologist who argued that the concept is central to Melanesian culture. According to Kisira, mana has exact correlates in various or similar correlates in various cultures, such as the Manitou of the Algonquin, the Orenda of the Iroquois, and the Wakanda of the Sioux people. Mana can belong to any physical thing and is not necessarily ensouled. Some life may have it while others may not. In mana, one cannot even differentiate a strong distinction between substance and force. Mana cannot be classified with any particular set of objects as Cordington and others attempt to do. Rather, Kassir's eidetic variation locates the essence of mana in, quote, the impression of the extraordinary, the inhabitual, the uncommon. This idea, quote, opposes the layer of everyday existence and the event of running in the customary beaten path along another layer and clearly stands out from it, close quote. Thus, for Kassir, mana is one expression of the sacred, a domain that is set apart by Thaumazde. Rather than functioning as the foundation or definition of religion, mana ought to be an expression of a more fundamental opposition between sacred and profane. In mana, we find one consistent form of predication. Quote, mana and its several equivalents do not denote a single definite predicate, but in all of them, we find a, pe a peculiar and consistent form of predication, whereby the holy is divided from the profane and set apart from the sphere of the ordinary in a religious sense, indifferent reality. By this process of division, the object of religious experience may really be said to be brought into existence." And here, Kassir is uh, engaging with um, this anthropologist, Marit, who says that you know, mana is the foundation of religion. And then he's also engaging, I think, uh, with a topic that was of central interest to both Buber and Adorno, and all of these people are talking about mana, and it's something one had to basically uh, speak about at the time. So there's a, actually a lot of texts around the early 20th century and middle 20th century that are talking about uh, this stuff. As Peterson rightly observed, Kassir's account of the origin of the sacred explicitly follows Rudolf Otto's account in Das Heilige, in which Otto locates the origin of the sacred in an emotion. Regarding the sacred, Otto writes that first it first begins to stir in the feeling of something uncanny, eerie, or weird. It is the feeling which emerging in the mind of primeval man forms the starting point for the entire religious development in history. Although mythical culture has its origin in the emotion, it cannot be reduced to an emotional experience of a subject or a collection of subjects. The practices and institutions of mythical cultures have a life that outstrip and outlive the momentary and short-lived emotional experiences of individuals. The mythical distinction between sacred and profane remains intact despite the arising and passing away of the emotions of individual subjects. For mythical culture, the sacred objects, such as the gods, do not cease with the passing of the relevant sentiments. Thus, although the sacred and profane must begin in feeling, they cannot be reduced to it or simply end in it. Because the sacred has independence or objective being vis-a-vis -vis the feeling of the subjects, the division between sacred and profane can only be established if the feelings themselves are objectified and rendered independent of the subjects themselves, both individually and collectively. There is a concept that uh, just came across uh, because we had a visitor coming to Hong Kong, uh, Giovanna Colombetti, who argues that, um, who is engaged in a research project right now on emotional scaffolding. And the idea is then that uh, temples and uh, churches and the like, uh, they're built uh, in order to elicit certain emotional responses from those who enter into the space and then engage in the ritual. So you could think about the emotional objectification, that's very neo-Kantian language, instead as emotional scaffolding, whereby the actual ma ma material elements are built in such a way as to elicit an emotional response from the person uh, who enters or participates in the rituals that take place there. Um, 
whether emotional scaffolding is the same thing as emotional objectification is something that I'll leave to the side for now. Because here everywhere emphasizes that myth would be impossible without the objectification of mythical feeling. In the philosophy of symbolic forms, volume two, mythical thinking, which is where most of my references are coming from, it's around 1925, I think is the text. So actually almost a hundred years old, starting next year. Because here argues that the most primordial mythical images such as nature, gods, and demons are objectifications of particular impressions. The sacred comes to be only when the purely inward must be objectified, must transcend itself into something outward. Just consider too Kassir's famous work, Language and Myth, Rachem Mutos. Here Kassir is adamant that subjective excitement becomes objectified and confronts the mind as a god or demon. Turning to Kassir's late work, Myth of the State, we find that here further, he here further clarifies the anthropological significance of mythical objectification. Like in his other texts, Kassir emphasizes how mythical symbolism leads to the objectification of feelings. However, here he further considers how this differentiates the human being from non-human animals. Certainly, non-human animals are capable of emotional responses to the objects in their environment. However, Kassir argues that non-human animals do not objectify their feelings in the same way humans do. They don't symbolize their emotional life. While the non-human animal may physically express their feelings via noise, physical posture, or other mode of expression, the human being symbolically expresses feelings by turning their emotions into works. Such works, such as a temple or a ritual, here the, the temple being the residence of the god, can persist as any independent physical object persists. Kassir is keen to note that mythical works, such as mythical rituals, express the social life of the human being, but astonishes the community as a whole. We cannot properly understand or appreciate mythical culture if we consider myth to simply be the phantasmagoria of a sole individual. The worship of the gods and the sacrifice of individuals to those deities invokes and requires participation from the whole community. Myth is an affair of the whole community that defines the worldview of the people as a whole. We would do well to remember that mythical symbols are a product of, according to Kassir, the a priori expressive function, Ausdrucksfunktion. Quoting Kassir, for myth, the image of a thing or its name is equivalent to the thing itself. This indifference becomes truly comprehensible only if we consider that in the mythical world, there is no logical representative or significant meaning, but that pure expressive meaning still enjoys almost unrestricted sway. The expressive function is a translation of the German Ausdrucksfunktion Ausdruck means expression, though more literally it signifies an outward pushing. In myth, emotions are pushed outwards. Consequently, the emotions themselves are separated from the agents subjected to them, and they're pushed outward into independent existence. The amazement experienced before the sacred object is pushed out into the thing, thereby transforming it. The object itself is amazing and the source of amazement and subjectivity. What are the tools of mythical objectification? In addition to language, Kassir follows Otto's analysis of the objectification of feeling by laying emphasis on mythical fantasy. Otto argues that all demons and gods spring from this origin in feeling and the various forms of mythical fantasy are various ways this experience of the uncanny has been objectified. Although feeling is more fundamental than mythical fantasy, mythical thinking is embodied in the imagination such that in myth objects are organized and classified by the mythical imagination and the mythical animation of nature. So it's we have feeling, we have imagination, these are all such. Thor, the god of thunder, is a particular. He's not a universal. He cannot be conceived by means of reason without a contradiction. Rather, as a particular image, I must imagine him to understand him. Likewise, to follow the story of Athena's birth does not require a capacity to grasp the universal features of anything. What is required is the capacity to picture Athena arising out of Zeus's head. Insofar as myth constitutes or consists of particular images, and imagination is that capacity whereby one can imagine particular images, the imagination is essential for myth understanding. Before myth can be understood by the imagination, they must first be formed by the imagination. Because mythical feeling does not remain merely a feeling, but is transformed into an independent being, imaginative objectification transforms the feeling into an image. The mythical imagination for Kassir must be productive. And for Kassir, mythical objectification has its seat in the a priori function of the productive imagination. It's the uh, Produktiven Einbildungskraft. So that's the German word Einbildungskraft, and it's also uh, 
a term coming out of Kant's philosophy of which Kassir is an, uh, an adherent. Sign exerts, the sign exerts a creative force in all forms of culture, including myth, which is a creative elaboration of human feeling through the productive imagination. Because the products of the imaginative synthesis are contingent and could always be otherwise, one cannot determine a priori how the imagination will be employed to objectify mythical feeling, the mythical figure of the sacred. Time and again, Kassir recognizes the absolute need to consult the empirical study of mythology, ethnology, in order to uncover the various directions of the productive imagination. So myth imagines the world, and a priori, one can't know how people will imagine the world. <laughs> and so one must engage in ethnography. <laughs> so if you're going to do a study of human nature and the mythical impulses, <laughs> you can't just do it from the armchair even though Kassir is doing it from the armchair and reading other people not doing it from the armchair. So that's the, you at least have to rely upon people not doing it from the armchair. Okay, try not to go off too much, stay on time. Kassir is explicit that the mode or tonality of mythical consciousness is this distinctive law of the concrescence or coincidence of the members of a relation. And we'll remember this is the law that I introduced at the very beginning. It's this law of the equivalence of sign is signified which according to Kassir is what accounts for the possibility of magic, the practice of magic and the belief in magic. This tonality or this law not only differentiates the mythical form of synthesis from other cultural forms, but it also constitutes the unique character of the mythical sacred. So long quote, the contents of mythical consciousness are not simply abandoned to unconnected singularities, rather there prevails in them also a universal, which however is of an entirely different kind and source from the universal of the logical concept. For precisely through their special character, all the contents that belong to mythical consciousness are rejoined into a whole. They form a self-enclosed realm. They possess a common tonality by virtue of which they are singled out from the series of the everyday and ordinary and common empirical existence." That's cool. Since it is the common tonality of the sacred objects by which they are singled out from the everyday and the common tonality or mode of mythical consciousness is this law of the equivalence of the relata, follows that Kassir reads the mythical law as the principle in virtue of which the sacred is distinguished from the everyday. The mythical law is the law of sacred being, the identity of sign and signify. The mythical law not only accounts for the possibility of magic, but for Kassir, it defines the domain of the sacred and thereby setting it apart. Okay, now on to the topic. That's all preparation for the topic, which is myth and science. The apparent conflict between the two and whether Kassir can account for the, uh, the uh, constant return of mythical, mythical life. Kassir observes that all forms of culture, including science, language, and art, for instance, originally appear within the matrix of myth. The historical record points to an original historic concurrence of myth, language, science, and art. Why emphasize the priority of myth here if they are concurrent? For Kassir, Myth is the absolute form in this early form. Neither language nor science nor art have separated themselves from myth as the overarching structural framework in which they exist in early human history. In this way, myth is the, he uses the word Mutterboden, uh, the, the mother earth or the kind of uh, the ground out of which the others are born, Mutterboden, which I'll just leave untranslated from. As history develops, the other forms do achieve their own separate existence, but this separate existence in history grows out of an originally mythical context. Kassir gives many examples of the difference between mythical and scientific understanding, and I'll just briefly talk about one difference in connection to space, or spatial consciousness. The division between the sacred and the profane is especially vis visible in the worship of threshold gods. The threshold of the temple marks the boundary between the sacred and the profane. It separates the sacred from the profane world. As Kassir reports at the festival of the Terminalia, the boundary stone itself was crowned with a garland and sprinkled with the blood of a sacrificial beast. Even contemplation, contemplari, can be traced back to Templum, the marked off space where the augur would observe the heavens for signs. The division of time, space, and number into sacred profane distinction further exemplifies the non-homogeneous character of these forms of synthetic unity. And Kassir goes painstakingly through many ways that, that this uh, distinction between sacred and profane is realized in mythical cultures. The scientific worldview, to the contrary, treats 
Each space is qualitative, qualitatively indistinct from the others. Each space is a here among here's, while spaces there are qualitatively indistinguishable. Each particular instantiates a universal that is equally realized in distinct particulars. However, mythical space qualitatively distinguishes spaces from each other. All spaces are not equally sacred. Basir remains committed to a traditional understanding of modern science as a discipline concerned with the discovery of universal laws. Cast in terms of this transcendental paradigm, such laws necessarily combine all particulars into a universal form, the universal and necessary form of scientific experience. In order to articulate such universal laws, consciousness requires a concept that can apply to every particular, irrespective of its empirical content. Quantity, the concept of quantity, enables such universal articulation, for anything can be quantified. Quantity is an absolute concept that can apply to everything. Following his teacher, Herman Cohen, Kassir discovers that it is in pure mathematics and its applied forms in theoretical physics that such concepts are paradigmatically employed. If we understand science on its own terms, we cannot understand it as a, as a form of culture that is consistent with the mythical worldview. Indeed, modern science understands itself as a force of disenchantment. And because scientific culture is fundamentally opposed to magic, it is equally opposed to the law of the identity of sign and signified that makes magic possible. While magic is central to the mythical worldview, scientific culture aims to replace magic and the imagination with reason and the concept. Given that in myth, the sign is the signified and the sign is a sensuous content, it follows that the signified must also be sensuous. Unlike in an allegorical representation, what is signified in myth is never an ideal content, a non-sensuous being that stands apart from the, non from the sensuous sign. Rather, in myth, the signified is completely buried in sensuous content. It is material through and through. Given the undifferentiated quality of mythical synthesis, Kassir unveils a concept of myth that is just as much magical as it is material. Myth is magical materialism. So this is not the same as religion. I'm not talking about religion at all. So if you thought I was talking about religion, my apologies. <laughs> religion for Kassir is different. Uh, it doesn't have this uh, necessary materialistic or em uh, embodied form. Um, on the other hand, although the scientific symbols are sensuous, for all signs are, in science, the meaning of the sign transcends the sign itself. It is ideal. Scientific formula like F equals MA are constituted by sensuous signs that can be seen and heard, but they signify a totally ideal meaning that transcends both perception and the imagination. Their meanings are universals that can only be grasped by reason. In scientific thought, the mythical law is broken. The sign is not identical to the signified. And finally, since the law of the coincidence of the relata is the form of sacred being, by negating the mythical law, scientific culture attacks the very distinction between the sacred and profane that is essential to mythical thought and intuition. Kassir is adamant that without an understanding of myth, we cannot understand any other form of culture, for all cultural forms arise out of myth. Indeed, without grasping the form of magic or the form of the sacred in myth, we cannot understand the meaning of disenchantment heralded by modern science, what it means to disenchant the world. Hence, by better penetrating the law of sacred being that constitutes myth, we achieve not only a better understanding of myth itself, but also the movement of scientific culture whose being rests upon the very negation and abolition of mythical culture. Kassir argues that science is fundamentally incompatible with myth. According to Kassir, quote, the worldviews of myth and theoretical knowledge cannot coexist in the same area of thought. They are mutually exclusive, close quote. The philosophical and scientific worldviews differentiates the universal from the particular. We all read Platonic dialogues where Plato was trying to, to teach us that a universal is not a particular. And then he tries to talk to Euthyphro and it doesn't work. Well, myth, according to Kassir, identifies them. It's defined by this identity of the relata. For science and philosophy, the identity of universal in particular is a contradiction and cannot be true. While for myth, such an identity is an unproblematic, sorry, is an unproblematic exemplification of mythical identity. Due to these stark differences, once science gains the upper hand, it appears impossible for myth to survive. Quoting Kassirha, once the day has dawned, very positive language, she gets in trouble with him. Uh, once the theoretical consciousness and theoretical perception are born, no return seems possible to the world of mythical shadows. All right, now on to Blumenberg's critique of Kassir. Although the rise of philosophical and eventually modern scientific cognition 
appears to signify the death knell for mythical consciousness. Some critics, such as Blumenberg, argue, Hans Blumenberg, that the return of mythical consciousness in political domains and moments like national socialism demonstrates the falsehood of Kassir's philosophy of history. With the return of myth in Nazi Germany, the human race witnesses a quote, fundamentally romantic regression, which it does not seem possible to fit into any philosophy of history. Kassir had this story of history as progressing towards self knowledge in the classical Kantian ideal. Kassir himself appears to acknowledge the return of myth in his myth, the state. While for Blumenberg, myth never disappeared, that's another story. On Kassir's own terms in Western culture, not only did myth disappear, but strictly speaking, it never returned. In the propaganda of Nazi Germany, Kassir discovers a new form of myth, myth according to plan. The myth of the state, this is written, I think, around 1945, so it's a 20 years after the original book, introduces a new concept of the manufactured myth, namely artificial things that are fabricated by cunning artisans. In the world of German fascism, myth this is a quote, myths are made like planes, close quote. These myths are consciously invented for the sake of controlling human life in all its personal and institutional aspects, whether these be religious, familial, economic, or political. These myths degrade human faculties in such a way that human beings eschew responsibility by seeking refuge in their collective identity. Such myths destroy the private sphere and ritualize all aspects of human life. In Nazi propaganda, we discover an appropriation of the magical use of the word that is at work in mythical culture and the power of those words to manipulate emotional states. In the myth of the state, as Luft writes, Sebastian Luft, myth is Kassir's term for every irrational element in our culture that makes the false pretense of being rational and culturally justified. Okay, so thinking about Kassir's response to Blumenberg. Kassir's diagnosis of the disease of national socialism by no means implies a return of myth. Myth as the mutaboden of all culture is not formed according to plan like the Nazi myths. By Kassir's lights, such myths, that is say the myths as the mutaboden, are not consciously invented for the sake of controlling people. When Herodotus' myths speak of the history and life of the gods, these are not metaphors or allegories that substitute or stand for some other meaning. Rather, the myth says what it says. Zeus means Zeus. Athena signifies Athena. There's no deep wisdom hiding beneath them. Both Schelling and Kassir approach myth in a tautagorical way, which means that neither philosopher looks to another strata of meaning by which to interpret the mythical signs. The tautagorical approach does not measure myth by an external standard of meaning, but reads it autonomously, that is, on its own terms. Following Shelley and Kassir would adamantly affirm that myth should be read autonomously, for myth should, quote, not be measured by the external criteria of value and reality, close quote. As Schelling writes, the tautagorical approach can explain how is it possible that the peoples of antiquity were not only able to bestow faith in these religious ideas, but were able to bring them to the most serious and part painful sacrifices, close quote. For Schelling and Kassir, Schelling is an important, uh, is the one who really inaugurated this tautagorical approach in Kassir's wanting to build on it. It is impossible to believe that people conducted such sacrifices would look upon their gods as mere allegories. No one sacrifices a child or virgin or whatever else to an allegory or symbolic representation of something else. Just as people do not worship allegories, they do not worship inventions. Schelling and Kassir both argue that myth cannot be reduced to a conscious invention constructed according to a plan. Because the myth, as the mutaboden of culture, is not constructed according to plan for the sake of deceiving people, Kassir describes the systematic industrial production of myths in propaganda of national socialism as a new thing. Or maybe not uh, but in some ways new, but its propaganda is very old, compared to myth as the mutaboden of human culture. Certainly, Kassir was an optimist about the direction of human history, and the rise of such myths in Germany surprised and upset him. But this is by no means a good reason to reject the theory of myth or culture in general, as Kassir presents it. Indeed, because human cultural development is fundamentally contingent, Kassir's philosophy does not preclude the possibility of such regressions into new forms of irrationalism. This is always a live possibility against which human life must guard itself. Myth remains canceled for Kassir as the mutabun in scientific culture, but it is here preserved in new forms that draw, upon, that draw upon old ones, such as collective identity. 
What is more, the critique levied against Kassir sometimes overlooks the fact that as early as language and myth, Kassir already recognized the fact that despite their cancellation by science, the cancellation, that's a, a new uh, sense in today's system, the gods reappear in the poetry of Herdelin and are preserved there as figures of the poetic imagination, such as Patmos or Once the Gods Walked Among Us, there are many, many poems that you, that you could pull from to find your local Germanist and ask them about him. In Herdelin, the mythical power breaks out again with all its full intensity and objectifying power. But here in the poetic consciousness, myth now becomes self-conscious myth. Myth can return in new forms, and sometimes these new appearances are not mere regressions. Kassir affirms and praises the presence of myth in Herdelin's poetry. Myth can arise in new in poetry, can be canceled and preserved in aesthetic form. If Kassir's philosophy can accommodate the rise of new forms of myth, such as in Herdelin, or if, if, he, if he does, Kassir's philosophy ought to be able to account for the transcendental possibility of such novel mythical developments. What enables the fact that, quote, myth has not really been vanquished or subjugated? It is always there, so this is a quote from Kassir, lurking in the dark and waiting for its hour and opportunity, close quote. This is again from 1945, uh, this point. Uh, the cynicism is developed here in light of historical developments. Given that myth is grounded in the expressive function, Ausdrucksfunktion, any new developments of mythical consciousness should in principle have their origin in the expressive function. We should remember that mythical culture is not identical to the expressive function. While the expressive function operates by this identity of the sign as signified, mythical culture is the objectification of that function in the material and institutional aspects of cultural life. Even if the material and institutional objectification of the expressive function in myth ceases to exist, the expressive function can still be operative. For Kassir, the demise of mythical culture and the replacement of myth by the scientific view of the world certainly implies that Bedeutung, or ideal meaning, has replaced Ausdruck, or expression, as the overarching schema through which human beings understand and form their world. However, Kassir argues that even though the rise of science has diminished the role of the expressive function in our understanding of self and world, it cannot be eliminated from our experience. So this is where Kassir surprises the people who think he's just repetition of old prejudiced enlightenment ideas. For myth always remains operative, or sorry, the, the function of expression always remains operative in the experience of other people. So now we're taking a little bit of a, a U-turn. As Andres points out, it is the function of expression through which a subject has access to a foreign psyche. Even when the mythical world wanes, the expressive function survives in our experience of other people. Quote, it is that form of knowledge by which the reality not of natural objects, but of other subjects is open to us. At times, Kassir will even describe the everyday experience of our life world as mythical. He actually does that one time. From the point of view of scientific reflection, the everyday non-critical and non-scientific experience of the life world can only be described as mythical. This is something that Kassir himself says. To understand why reflective and scientific consciousness would be impelled towards such a description of experience, even when the mythical institutions and rituals have vanished, we must think through the structure of the experience of others and compare it to the form of the expressive function. So for Kassir, transcendental consciousness is a condition that makes objects possible. If it were itself an object, it would be both the condition that makes the object possible and the object itself. However, this would be a contradiction, for the condition is always distinct from the object it makes possible. Since all objects require a transcendental consciousness to make them possible, if consciousness were an object, then a second transcendental consciousness must be posited in order to account for the objectivity of the first transcendental consciousness. Since this would generate an infinite regress, Kassir argues that transcendental consciousness cannot itself be an object. Consciousness is, quote, uh, the phenomenon of consciousness in, in general, it is a basis phenomenon. It is the basis of our awareness of objects. And because consciousness is the window by which objects are visible, he says it cannot itself be an object. Concerning the basis phenomena, Kassir writes that, quote, we are in them, but we cannot conceive them as objects. This gets him into all kinds of trouble, which I won't talk about, but uh, the trouble is in the book later on. For both Edmund Husserl and Ernst Kassirer, consciousness is intentional, it's object-directed. 
And exactly because consciousness is conscious of, of an object, the other consciousness, the thou, can only appear to the I as an object of consciousness. Hence, as long as the other subject appears to consciousness as, an, as another subject, it must also appear to the I as an independent or separate unity of subjectivity and objectivity. Insofar as the other is a transcendental subject with its own intentional experiences, the I cannot appear to the other subject except as an object of consciousness. In short, even if the transcendental subject cannot be an object, if consciousness appears to the other as another subject, and the subject can only appear as an intentional object to others, the transcendental consciousness can only appear to others as a subject that is also an object, that is, as a unity of subjectivity and objectivity. Regarding the expressive function, Kassir observes that our experience of others is defined by an expressive function, which is characterized by a fundamental indistinction. Quoting Kassir, its particular privilege is precisely that it does not admit of a difference between image and thing, the sign and what it designates. In the case of other minds, the experience of others neither admits of a distinction between the subject and the object, nor the mind and the body that one encounters. The term for expression, Ausdruck, which we've mentioned, articulates this well. The subjectivity, which is not an object, is pushed outward into the object and is thereby expressed by the object. This philosophical description corresponds to our experiences in the everydayness of our life world. Consider one's everyday engagements with colleagues in an office setting, or I, I just met Ben just a minute ago, not just his body. Upon arriving at the office or in Macau, one may greet Ben with a friendly, it's good to see you. One sees his body, but the greeting does not say, it's good to see your body, Ben. <laughs> that could be taken in, a, in another way, and it would be uh, inappropriate, naturally. This is being recorded. One sees the body, but the greeting does not say, it's good to see your body. The thou with whom I interact is not distinguished from the objective, and in this case, the bodily presence of the other person. Because the bodily expression of the other is the sign that signifies the presence of the other person, and the person appears in a way that is indistinguishable from their bodily expression, the experience of the other person conforms to the form of expression, whereby sign is signified. Naturally, the indistinct presence of the other in our pre-reflective experience does not mean that they only appear as objects. They appear as subjects who can understand and respond to our greeting. We do not ordinarily greet our office door with, it's good to see you. The other appears as an object who's also a subject, an indistinguishable unity of subjectivity and objectivity. Moreover, since subjectivity is never reducible to an object, to appear as a subject means that the other cannot appear identical to or reducible to any object one encounters, such as a body in space and time. Kassir notes that in the phenomena of otherness, its givenness and visibility makes itself known to be inwardly animated, of course. I always already understand that the other subject has an inner world to which I do not have immediate access that is expressed and articulated in and through their body. When I observe a grimace on the face of my friend, I may ask out of interest and care, how are you feeling today? In the question, I implicitly acknowledge that their subjectivity transcends that experiential content to which I have immediate access. For this reason, consciousness of the other mind for Kassir, and this is, I think, interesting because hardly anyone writes about Kassir's view of other minds, is fundamentally paradoxical. Consciousness is always of an object. So consciousness of the other is a consciousness of an object. But consciousness is not an object. Hence, the other cannot appear except as an object that is not an object. Consciousness of others appears to be fundamentally paradoxical. Here, Descartes' problem of other minds, uh, Descartes' problem of of other minds as well as well known, doubts the existence of other minds because other minds, unlike the self in his epistemology, are not given immediately to consciousness. However, this problem has a totally different formulation in Kassira. Given that consciousness of other minds is inconsistent, it's contradictory, how in principle can one be aware of others? If the philosopher holds that contradictions cannot be true or follows the principle of non-contradiction, the philosopher will struggle to simply accept the presence of others as a true contradiction. Again, if one hasn't thought about it like Kassir, no problem, but according to Kassir, this is a contradiction. On the one hand, one can affirm the existence of others as miraculous. Kassir quotes Ludwig Klage, someone no one reads. He's actually someone I think who uh, invented this term logocentrism, which is used widely in continental philosophy. Klage affirms this option that the presence of others is a miracle. 
quote, the world is governed by a magical power, which may be regarded equally well as corporeal or spiritual, and which is totally indifferent to this distinction. If self and other are contradictory in their appearance to one another, the self and the other may be miracles that shouldn't exist but do. Miracles that neither the philosopher nor the scientist can grasp. Such a response may place self and other squarely in the, in the domain of mystical or religious experience. On the other hand, in order to preserve the coherence of the theoretical worldview, one can easily preserve the consistency of one's experience by denying that others exist. Of course, we can consider this as a logical possibility, but I cannot believe it. I give this lecture because I expect there are other people to hear it. This can only be the case if there, if there are others. Indeed, the public character of meaning even, I would say, demands it. Rather than simply deny the existence of other minds or declare them to be miracles, philosopher might, might instead deny this absolute coincidence of subject and object in the experience of others. By taking this route, philosophy could attempt to evade the contradiction, which is what we always want to do. This is our almost our philosophical instinct. Uh, it's no longer mine, but it certainly used to be, and achieve a consistent understanding of others. However, this approach has severe difficulties. On this model, one can be directly conscious of an object, such as a body, but only indirectly conscious of a mind connected to that body. And by comparing the bodily object that appears with oneself and one's own experiences, one could attempt to establish the existence of other minds by analogy. Or there are other approaches like the uh, simulation theory, there's the the theory theory. So there's a lot of different theories, which I won't talk about because it's not an analytic philosophy talk, but I'll revisit it. However, <clears throat> by dividing the subject from the object in the consciousness of the other, the other could not appear in principle for Hussein, since consciousness would only ever be aware of the object and never the subject, not even indirectly. As a result, Kassir is right to be suspicious that the theoretical worldview can produce consistent knowledge of others. Kassir is adamant that neither any knowledge of things nor any reflection can produce knowledge of others. One cannot save the consistency of the consciousness of others by invoking the absolute non-coincidence of subject and object, like we said, for consciousness would never encounter the other as a subject, but only an object. For Kassir, the only way to overcome the contradiction is to give up on attempting to explain it conceptually. Instead, to understand the expressive function, one has no other choice but to occupy or live into the expressive relation in the perceptual encounter with an, with an another. This is not a theoretical answer or solution, but it's more like an act of desperation on the part of a philosopher who's exhausted their options. Quote, ultimately, we can avoid these contradictions. So he says, avoid these contradictions only by returning to their actual source by putting ourselves back at the center of that symbolic relation in which the psychic appears related to the bodily and the bodily to the psychic in the purely expressive phenomenon. Of course, the contradiction remains elusive. Sorry, it remains for reflective consciousness, but the contradiction disappears when we cease to reflect, for in ceasing to reflect, no concept appears and no conflict between concepts appears either. Because even the secular mind has an experience of other minds, and this experience operates according to the expressive function, even the secular mind has an experiential basis upon which they can appreciate and understand mythical consciousness. Even if mythical consciousness appears as a contradiction for theoretical awareness, sign is signified seems to be a contradiction, for it identifies the universal and the particular in the law of the co coincidence of the members of the relation, the experience of other minds forms a common experiential ground that connects mythical and scientific cognition. Thus, despite the fact that Kasira himself no longer lives in a mythical world, his experience of others by his lights makes it possible for him to offer a theory of myth for the same expressive function is at work in both mythical culture and the experience of others. Rather than follow Carnap and deny the truth of the expressive function, or follow Clogus and absolutize the expressive function through the exclusion of other forms of, of culture like science, so Clogus is an irrationalist, Kassir affirms the middle path. Close quote. Or quote, our standpoint is critical. We uphold neither the falsity, skepticism, nor the truth of the expressive function. Rather, we seek to limit critically and justify critically its achievements in the construction of the cultural world. 
So we are invited to consider a laboratory in which scientists are experimenting, are experimentally testing hypotheses. In the scenario, science and language are operative. Here in the laboratory, different scientists work together. They set up and execute experiments by which they test the hypothesis. To communicate with each other, they require language, which is another story. On the one hand, myth is totally absent, for the division of the world into sacred and profane is gone. Likewise, be because the belief in and commitment to magic is consciously and explicitly rejected, the mythical law of the identity of sign and signify that underlies the magical worldview is implicitly cast into doubt in that laboratory. However, the expressive function that undergirds myth is not completely absent. To communicate with each other, each must recognize the other person. And without the expressive function, this would not be possible. Thus, the expressive function of myth, according to Kassir, is active and operative even in such settings whose objective features are overwhelmingly formed by scientific cognition. Thus, although myth as a form of material culture is absent or is diminished within a scientific worldview, the expressive function of mythical consciousness is active and realized wherever there is intersubjective consciousness. Indeed, mythical ways of thinking even has the potential to appear in scientific life. Because mathematical physics regularly abstracts from the content of intuition, excuse my Kantian language, uh, the content of sensory experience, maybe it's better. Um, it can order the minds of others and its own according to mathematical function concepts. However, it cannot completely replace or supplant the experience of others. Science can formally totalize the intuitive or sensible content by equations, but the ideal character of its totalizing not only leaves room for expressive experience, but in some respects requires it, as we just discussed in this laboratory setting. Insofar as the scientific work is social, the consistent and ideal thinking of scientific work appears to presuppose an experience that is expressive, that it cannot understand on its own terms, and that may even violate its very norms. Although the scientific mind may be inclined to deny the existence of the experience of other minds in order to absolutize the consistency of the scientific worldview, it would not be consistent with experience and would even risk the annulment of science itself. But in strong ethical terms, the attempt to extinguish the expressive function in human experience would be absolutely dehumanizing and wrong. So Daniel Dennett's views, for example, are unethical. He's an unethical, uh, he has an unethical character because of the nature of his thought. Kassir has this to say to Carnap, and maybe also Daniel Dennett. This is being reported, right? Okay, it's fine. The spirit world is not sealed off. Your mind is closed. Your heart is dead. That's Ernst Kassir, not me. <laughs> yeah. He's trying to walk a line between science and myth and say somehow walk a line in between them. This is, so he gets critiques from everybody, from, from the science people, the religion people, everyone piles on, but he's trying to walk a line, a very difficult line indeed. Because the experience of other minds conforms, I'm almost done here, coming in on time. Because the experience of other minds conforms to the expressive function, and myth is the objectification of that function in the material and institutional life of the human being, even when mythical culture has vanished from human life, forms of mythical culture have the potential to reappear in different material and institutional forms, whether they be political, poetic, or otherwise. Consider the popularity, and this is again, um, still very new, um, uh, experimenting on some of these ideas, so I, I love your feedback. Some of you may know these uh, examples. Consider the popularity of the book, I, I think it was a book, The Secret. I just saw the, the movie, uh, a best-selling book in the US and probably elsewhere all over the world that systematically exploits the identity of the expressive function for economic gain. I assume that whoever wrote it is exploiting, but actually who knows what their mental states are like. I'm not sure exactly. They may authentically believe it and then publish it and other people authentically believed it, but my cynical side says that maybe there's some exploitation going on here. The basic idea of the secret draws on the mythical law of the identity of thought and being. If you wish for something with enough strength the object you wish for will be yours. So it's wishful thinking, of course, as a principle. As is evident, magical thinking does not just reappear in politics and poetry, but is pre uh, prevalent in many aspects of modern cultural life and is enabled by the expressive function that lies at its basis. Why are human beings, so this is 
it's just an interesting question that I just want to think about freely here. Uh, perpetually drawn to magical ideas at any time, uh, but especially now where we have such a powerful science uh, at our backs and in, in enabling this wonderful Zoom call and all this other stuff. Especially in an era in which science is so ascendant. It is not enough to declare that people who believe in the secret are ignorant, naive, stupid, or uninformed. That may be the case, but even highly educated and informed persons are perpetually drawn to such fantastical new age ideas, such as cord cutting. And there's a lot of other amazing things on YouTube. I don't know where they came from, but I've, I've been going down a rabbit hole recently. One reason may be that the expressive function which underlies such ideas is always at work in their life world and in all of our life world namely in their intersubjective experience. The more the scientific worldview is advanced as the only lens through which human beings should approach the world or are allowed to see the world, the more alienated human beings may become from their intersubjective, intersubjective existence. For sure, it is only reasonable to expect that some persons more sensitive to the presence of the expressive function and the potential loss to their life world and their humanity would look to rescue their humanity by looking to new forms of mythical awareness. Indeed, the condescending attitude towards such forms of culture may indeed indicate a lack of self-consciousness about the dehumanizing impulses and risks that scientism itself poses. Because this reappearance occurs in cultural contexts where the other forms of culture life, such as art and science, have superseded myth or broken off from it, on Kassir's view, Myth cannot really reappear as a homogenous whole that constitutes its original form as the mutabodin of, of culture. On the contrary, myth can only reappear in heterogeneous forms in art, economics, or politics. In conclusion, because the expressive function of objectification is never fully absent on Kassir's theory of mind and theory of world, Kassir's theory of myth is actually built to account for the reappearance or the desire for a mythical form. This is where it calls us to reconsider how we can and how we should negotiate the mythical and scientific impulses of human life today. So, thank you. Just so people are aware, there are procedural differences now. You'll know the UFO by the microphone. Uh, to my knowledge, you can just tap the little button, it will go from red to green, and then you're pretty much good to go. So I don't need to distribute the uh, other microphones for anything there. And with that said, I'll begin to take down some names because folks, so I see red information about the top of the light, and others can raise their hands and I'll tap them. Please go ahead. Well, I'll start with something completely irrelevant. When I was a young person, I watched a show called. Um, Romper room. And at the end of the show, this is nothing to do with Okay, but I'm just writing it down so I, I, I can go back and find it. What is it called again? Romper room? Romper room. And it was for little kids. And at the end of the show, the, the, uh, you'll see why I brought this up. The, the person, Miss Sally, would say, oh, I see Billy and I see Jane. And I noticed after a while that she never saw me. And I have a very unusual name. And from that, I inferred she wasn't seeing anybody. She was just saying names. And he said that he saw me, so I finally got seen. So I have a bunch of questions, but I'll try to focus them down. Um, so in the critique of Nazism, if I'm understanding what you were saying about that, or what Kassir was saying, there's this idea that myths cannot be manufactured. And it seemed to me like a number of the other things that you said contradicted that. Like, that the secret is created as a form of exploitation. It sure seems like the person, I've seen it too. Um, you, you've seen the secret? I've seen it. I, I'm from Boulder. I, oh, the whole are there city. a lot of secret people there? Yeah, the well, whole I mean, city like... is based on this. <laughs> Sorry, that was an ambiguous statement. Right. Okay, the whole city is based on the secret. Yeah, this very Wow, similar. okay. I'm going to have to go uh, there for a few I'll minutes. point out for those people that don't know that the former president of the United States, now running for president again, was a fought, is a, grew up in the Norman Vincent Peale Church, which believed in affirmations. Same kind of idea. Oh, right. And he did 
say, I'm going to become president. It worked out for him. So that would lead to him believing it. But the, the thing, that was the first kind of like, well, look, it seems like myths are being created to uh, specifications, which led me to think about um, sort of the Nazi propaganda thing. Which Kassir agrees, though, by the way. So I maybe I, I, I misled me because he does say um, that the difference is that the myths in Nazism are consciously manufactured. They are. I'm, just, I'm losing your voice. Sorry. The myths in National Socialism are intentionally manufactured. They are created for the sake of um, for the sake of manipulating people. Unlike uh, myths like the. OK, so it isn't the claim isn't that you can't create myths, the, the claim is that there are different kinds of myths. Yeah, there are those that are uh, manufactured on purpose to mislead and uh, to deceive, uh, like those, uh, like possibly the secret, again, I, I, don't, I don't know the, all the details, but at least uh, uh, German fascism, but that's different from um, the so-called uh, organic. Exactly, the myth as the Mutterboden which he says uh, are different in kind. So this is his attempt to defend himself against right. Blumenberg, who so, wants to say, oh, myth came back, because you didn't see that or expect it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, um, all right, I'm gonna continue there. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just please, a second. Please. And that is, one, it doesn't seem necessarily true that a manufactured myth would have to be malevolent. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and it seems like, at least on my reading on this, that the kind of control that's being exerted there in the Nazi propaganda is an attempt to create a collective identity which did not previously exist. And it doesn't seem to me that is necessarily malevolent. It turned out to be vastly propaganda, you know, problematic in the case we're talking about but it it seems like this leads to the other thing and sorry i'm talking so much no it's, it's good the um i'm apologizing to them <laughs> oh, okay. um, the, the the thing that i was missing from what you were talking about and i bet you'll tell me that i either missed it or you didn't mention it was there was a lot of talk about encountering the other as a kind of like you and i kind of thing but it seemed like the idea of collective identity and encountering, like, you know, I'm walking around the United States, haven't done that in a long time, but let's say I am. The people I encounter are fellow Americans. And one of the ways I'm encountering them is as other Americans. Or they're Canadians and tricking me like Ben, but- it Happens a lot. Right, it does. And uh, so, my point there is that it seems like like ritual yeah. seems like a collective identity thing. And it isn't just the temples, yes. but there's a, like the Confucians would talk about this alignment of roles and emotions that occur in ritual. And, and of course, magic is very much about ritual and often about collective rituals. And so I didn't really get a good sense of that. Hmm being present in Kassir's work, it seemed like a lot of it was about, like, as I understood your talk, which maybe is not as good as it could have been, was about individual experience and individual identity. Yeah. So yeah, thanks so much. I'm, I'm really happy you you raised the point about collective identity because it's it does show up in the this book manuscript. Uh, right. Uh, it's a, uh, another important aspect of uh, mythical culture that I, I, I didn't uh, touch on. Uh, but maybe I'll just say two things, um, try to keep my response relatively Quite brief, sure. but they're great questions. My, the, the first point, I think I, I just ag agree with you that um, perhaps manufactured myths, they're not necessarily malevolent. At least in the case of uh, National Socialism, they were, and Kassir thought that they were. Right. Now, uh, part of the malevolent aspect, I think from Kassir's point of view, I think he does look at this reversion to collective identity right, uh, uh, in an unfavorable way. Right, right. And I think it has also to do with his progressive sense of self-knowledge in human culture, which I intentionally left out because <laughs> there's just too much to, to talk about. Right, so sure. 
But I, I think that's, this is um, part of his story of his progressive self-knowing is that we come to recognize ourselves individually right. as somehow autonomous sources of responsibility. Okay. Hmm. But that's another like issue that needs to be addressed, but it's a nice that you raised the point because it, it kind of illustrates this progressive understanding of self-knowledge. Um, the bit about ritual is very nice though, because it fits very well into Kassir's, uh, another good, good examples of Kassir's view. He actually takes the very specific position that uh, the actual stories and myths are actually uh, based upon rituals, right? And they're actually a telling of a ritual. Hmm. There was some debate about whether the ritual proceeds the telling or the telling the ritual. Right. Uh, I'm not really educated to make a judgment about this, but he does talk about examples of uh, how in the ritual, the one playing the part right. doesn't view themselves as just playing a role, right. but rather they are the identity that they're playing. Like, I think uh, Gertz talks about this too. He's an anthropologist, I think a well-read one from the 70s. I think the book is The Interpretation of Cultures, where he talks about um, Rangda and Barong. I think I've said the names correctly. Um, it's in Balinese culture. There's a ritual where people play this um, these monsters and witches that we would say represent good and evil. Right, right. But then when the anthropologist asks, are you playing that? They look at you like you're an idiot. Because they are Rangda, they are uh, Barong, right? So there, Kassir sees in ritual activity this identity of sign and signified that he also recognizes in magical practice too. Um, so um, the point about collective identity also can be brought back to this issue about sign and signified. He talks about this in, re in re relation to totemism, but I'll leave that alone for now. I think the progressive side of this history has a role in his maybe assumption right. that the reversion reversion back to collectivist views of identity are maybe problematic. Right. Uh, well, so, maybe they are. I'm yeah. not arguing that they are. Yeah, but it's just, um, and maybe also just to fill out the Kassir story, which is, I, I think, good reason to be suspicious of the idea that history is progressing towards, uh, right? <laughs> I think there's good reason to doubt that. Yeah. Thanks so much for the questions. Edge closer to that green thing. <laughs> All right, yes. Um, so you said uh, about a third of the way into the talk uh, yeah. that this is about myth, that yeah. it's not about religion. And oh, yes, yes. Clear. But then I noticed that in the, the final, maybe the final third of the paper, that yeah. religion words did come up two or three times. Mm. Um, and yeah. I, I wondered if that was significant. Mm. It, it seems I, I don't know anything about Kassir in particularly, but mm. it seems hard to believe that he would not have been mm. um, theologically aware. Yeah. And you, yeah. you mentioned the connection with uh, Martin Buber. Yes. So yeah. I, I wondered if there was anything uh, that connects in Kassir's, Kassir's theory with um, the idea of the I Thou. Um, Yes. Subjects, design yes. Subjects, yes. You know? yes. 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 Thanks so much for the question. Maybe I'll respond to maybe maybe I'll take this as an opportunity to say something about religion, as Kasir understands it. And sometimes he'll use the word mythical religious worldview. So, and then sometimes he'll, in, in, at, at the very end of this 1925 book, he makes a real strong division between uh, myth and religion. But regularly, he will uh, talk about the mythical religious world. So then my question is, why, did, why, why do we sometimes heap them together? Why is that a natural thing to do? But then also, what is supposed to distinguish religion, so-called for him, from myth? And then the second question is very nice one about Martin Buber. I think one of the distinctions that I'm, I think I had a footnote about him in here, because I, I had to read a little bit of Buber for the looking through this consciousness of others business. And I think somewhere Buber says, and again, I'm not a Buber expert, so someone may have to correct me, that the I-Thou re relation is different from the experience of objects. I think that's just correct, right? Okay. So there's I-It, I-Thou, and it's, it's not as though the I-Thou is an I-It relation, or the I-It is an I-Thou. But what you'll notice, the way that I tried to build the contradiction, 
And I, I really think Kasir is surprising that way because you think sometimes he's this very boring, like, okay, we're going to repeat the 19th century progressive stuff. But then he comes up with these pretty wild ideas like the experience of the it is also, the, is, is also a consciousness of the Tao. That is to say, you can't cleanly distinguish the it from the Tao. So I think one difference, it seems to me, again, this is a working hypothesis, so people who know the Bupa better may also correct me on this, uh, that he's blending the it and the thou into one. And that's part of the paradox of consciousness of others. But maybe Buber does something similar somewhere else, I'm not sure. Uh, but Buber does talk about mana. So there, there's a lot of discussion there about this. Um, religion, just briefly, because it's such an important topic and I, and I, I, I didn't mention it. I think one reason why Kassir is happy to talk about mythical religious consciousness is because both religion and myth divide the world into sacred and profane. So for Kassir, religion is still oriented by this general distinction that there's a sacred and a, and a, and a profane. There's, uh, but he somehow seems to think that religion invokes uh, negation in a way that you don't see in uh, myth, mythical worldview that enables the signified to be trans bodily or not material. So remember, I, I briefly said something about myth as magical materialism. But Judaism, and in particular, the Hebrew prophets are not materialists, basically, according to, to Kassir. There are these, uh, uh, you should not make an image of God. Right? There is this, like, you shouldn't worship an image of God. There's this difference between image and God. But she also sees in um, Islam, and uh, you could even see in certain forms of Protestantism and in Buddhism, he sees it in, in Buddhism where neg negation is really central, the negation of desire uh, to achieve nirvana, the extinguishing of the fire, which involves a kind of negation, even if at the end of the day, there's affirmation coming. So he says that there is a, there's a sacred profane distinction operative in religion that makes the signified trans-physical or non-physical is a non-physical sacred, which he thinks is more or less not operative in myth, where a sign is signified. And what we're dealing with is a kind of magical materialism. So one thing that he doesn't do, which is very common following on she uh, is he doesn't distinguish religion from myth by appealing to the number of gods. That's like what Schelling did. Is that, well, you have like myth, which is polytheism. And then you have religion, which involves monotheism. But then you're like, well, isn't Buddhism a religion? or forms of Buddhism? That's another debate, I know, <laughs> question, but Kassir wants to say, yeah, of course, Mahayana Buddhism is, is a religion, like Judaism is, and you don't define it by the number of gods or whether there are any gods. It's about the way sacred and the sacred and the profane are, are ordered. Um, yeah, that was longer than I should have gone, <laughs> but the whole bit about religion is, uh, maybe also a contentious definition. So on, on the one hand, the, the mythical religious is one, one idea, divide the world by sacred and profane, but the nature of the sacred is somehow different. Thanks. So uh, I'm also a bit unsure of the framing, right? oh. so maybe I'll approach just from this okay. chat here. So this comes to us, for those who can't read in the back, from Norihito Nakamura. Uh, Norihito says, thank you for your insightful talk. And then the question, while accepting the good and bad power of myths as the human condition, how can we criticize political ideology? Or what is the difference between myth and ideology, or are both the same? Marcus Gabriel tries to distinguish these two in his book, Kikshona, but it still seems yeah. Yeah, it's good to uh, receive your comment, uh, Norhito. Uh, also, I I, I want to say good to see you again, but because I know you, <laughs> but uh, good to read you again. Um, yeah. So for Marcus Gabriel, I I haven't read the fiction um, book, the fictions book, so I don't know how Marcus um, how Marcus tries to do it. So I can't speak to that. 
Um, but I think um, Kassir in the myth of the state has this idea that one of the, one of the problems with, uh, for example, Nazi ideology is, is that uh, among other things, besides it being false, et cetera, et cetera, is that it robs the, the human of their, of their aut autonomy. They're somehow, um, they're somehow feel liberated uh, by their uh, giving up of their autonomy and responsibility to a, another. So they somehow uh, have this uh, experience of liberation uh, from this, which is a kind of, I think from Kassir's point of view, a false liberation, but it's again, an area that I haven't touched on here. It's again, part of this progressive aspect of human culture that Kassir develops, where he thinks that there's a kind of progressive self-understanding of one's ethical significance. Um, but there is an overlap between ideology and myth here, which is important. And this is for, for Kassir. Myth is not conscious of itself. That this mythical culture out of which human culture develops is not aware of what it's doing. It's not aware that its myths are in fact um, not reflections of reality as it really is. Right. And there is then for Kassir this idea that through length, through the development of language and scientific culture, human beings can develop this capacity for self-consciousness that is missing at the level of myth. And then you see in ideology, arguably also kind of absence of self-consciousness um, and of course, a lack of willingness uh, for critique. Um, so I see uh, the connection that you might be drawing here, but it's an open question. I mean, I'm not sure uh, how to fully draw these two apart, except by the distinction Kassir himself draws at the beginning of Myth of the State, um, which is about the origin of myth versus ideology, presumably, where the one is not an intentional or it's an, some kind of invention or some kind of uh, manufactured uh, thing. Uh, and further, I, I would say this mutaboden of myth, this mutaboden of myth really applies to, it's, it's not just the story, it's somehow the ritual, it's the worldview, it's the material culture, it's somehow a homogenous form of culture that relates to everything. Whereas ideology, we think about ideologies today, the question is, do they operate in the same way? And they very well may. Uh, and if so, how do we separate? It's a good question. Something I'll, I'll have to think about more. So I just uh, had a question when you were unpacking the point raised by Victoria. Uh, so the discussion was about the distinction between myth and religion in particular. Uh, so if, if I understand correctly, the, this distinction does not depend upon the number of deities or gods. Yeah. So I wonder what exactly is this distinction about? Is it about the specific metaphysic that is implied by either the myth or the religion. And then just by chance, don't ask me even why, I yeah. bumped into some readings about one, uh, Egypt, one Egyptian pharaoh uh, that um, uh, was uh, kind of dismissed by archeologists until a few decades ago, should be uh, the father of Tutankhamun. And uh, his name I have to write down because I don't remember Akhenaten, Akhenaten. And I found it interesting. This reading was interesting because apparently Akhenaten uh, was very active in the field of religious reforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, historians and archaeologists uh, tend to think that probably is the first the first form of a mono he introduced the first form of monotheism in the history of um, of the civilization in the, in, in the, at least in the West and in Italy, because he got rid of all the rituals and all the gods that were worshiped until his time and introduced the cult of a one uh, unique uh, uh, entity and the worship of one entity. I don't know how if to call him a god because it's the sun, yeah. uh, Aten, the, uh, Aten, the sun. Uh, that lasted only until he was alive, 
because then uh, when he when he died, there was a kind of a mass memorial mm -hmm. on his uh, figure, and that's why we just learn about his pharaoh uh, in probably starting from eight years ago, one hundred years ago. Uh, so, what that kind of uh, religion would be, in according to Kafka, here we have a monotheism, okay, but we we have the worshiping of um, the planet. Here, I go back to my question: Is this distinction between myth and religion a distinction about me the, the ontological or metaphysical realm? And, and what? Thanks for the question and for the, the <clears throat> yeah, this archaeological and anthropological historical example. It's very nice. Um, so I would maybe begin with the abstract point. Um, what is distinctive about religion, according to Kassir, to simplify, is that myth and religion are both forms of uh, symbolism. They're both symbolic forms, because all forms of culture are, even science, symbolic. So then the question is, what is the specific difference for religious symbolism? And he has what he calls a symbolic schema, a schematism. <laughs> um, and it's basically, it's very kind of Kantian, because that's what, you know, Kant has the schematism for categories. Kassir has the schematism for symbols. And it's basically threefold. First is the sign is the signified. That's where myth falls. Then there's the sign which signifies a meaning that transcends the sign. And that's something like what he calls uh, uh, traditionally uh, translated as representation. And religion falls under this. And there are, uh, in the history of human culture, this here doesn't think it's, it's not like you, know, you just have myth here, and then it just stays myth. And like over there, there's religion, and then they somehow come into contact. But that actually uh, mythical culture through its own life and its own processes sometimes develops into religious points of view. That is from a symbolic point of view. It's a transformation contingently historically, right, as you're kind of giving me here this nice example of the nature of the sacred, which then can sometimes turn on the on even the, the, uh, the precedence in one's own culture and say, this is myth, not true religion. He gives an example of the Avesta in Persian religion where the gods of I think, fire and light then become demons or lower order gods and how there's this kind of transformation from within the mythical point of view. He even talks about the generalizing and the process where, whereby one can see in particular historical examples where the plurality of gods get condensed into, let's uh, say, the, the worship of like time itself or of one planet. But as long as it remains schematically bound to this uh, symbolic structure of sign is signified. I think for him, he'd still be inclined to think of it more mythologically and less religiously. But he does say that, you know, like human thinking is messy and human culture and development is messy, right? So it's not always so clean. Like mythical dimensions remain sometimes somehow preserved within religious ways of thinking. And within the same traditions, you'll find more mythically or more religiously oriented, uh, one could say, ways of thinking about the sacred. So I think this is also a very um, contingent and messy matter, but he does try to give some relatively clear markers of uh, that would help us maybe in our classifications, but perhaps not not every case will 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 cleanly fall. Maybe sometimes there's these border cases too. Thank yeah. You. Thanks so much. Thank you. Just yeah. just just one yeah. line, yes. but maybe we can talk later because you know. Um, I'm not an expert of Kassirer and of the literature, but my suspicion since the very first minutes of the talk, I mean, not my suspicion, actually my, my thought was, is there anything that we can really find in human existence in them that is related to language and that is purely amythical if we, uh, but you know, we can talk- Purely about analytical? Pure, no, no. Amythical. Oh, purely yeah. amythical. Uh, amythical. Yeah, so clear. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So just a brief comment, uh, and we won't have to, we can talk about it later because we're, we're running out of time. Um, 
the Kasir that I gave today is much more sympathetic to myth than the Kasir you'll usually hear. Because I'm trying to really work out what the 1925 philosophy of myth book is saying. And it's a defense of myth against the enlightenment. So he says there are these enlightenment thinkers like, like, like Bacon who, who will say, I understand myth, it's just superstition. I've understood it. Failure of science. Or Max Mueller who says, who says, what is myth? Disease of language. And, science, and Kassir says, myth is not just disease of language or not just uh, pseudoscience. It operates by its own autonomous law. So actually, Kassir has this reputation of being this kind of repetition of the enlightenment, but actually he's attempting to show how myth successfully realizes a form or structure that's distinct from language or uh, science. But he definitely is still of the persuasion that scientific culture is fundamentally distinct and amythical. Mm -hmm. Transmythical and uh, uh, really opposed to mythical life. And this is one way of explaining the forms of conflict that we find ourselves in today. But it's, it's a, something to think about. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, I was kind of saying it inspired me out of the I guess you hopefully you can fit a couple more exchanges with Pedro if you want to. I think it's quick. Um, I'm sorry. Here I am. Hi, Professor Moss. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well, yes. Yes. Apparently, yeah. So, uh, I hope you did not mention uh, Tolkien. You know, the author of the Lord of the Rings. I lost the first ten minutes of oh. the presentation, but I was thinking a lot about uh, his book and. Well, I'm not sure if this is interesting, but he, well, he created the myth, right, for the language he invented. He invented language for the elves. And also, he he had the image of the ring, which uh, when asked about, he said, this is actually a machine. So I guess the idea is that in a like modern, modern civilization, it's based on, on the machine and people have uh, some kind of sensibility towards things like they can change everything and can transform nature at will. And so he would say, the machine for us is like magic. It's like the ring, like it's something powerful that, you know, creates stuff. And, and maybe the idea is that we, I wonder if that's, that was his idea, like, this technological civilization is like, I'm sorry, I'll put it in another, another way, uh, like technology is mythical, maybe in some sense. We we have a, I wonder if this makes any sense to you. Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the question. That sounds more like Adorno a little bit, uh, the idea that oh, I see. technology is mythical because Adorno has this I guess, critique of enlightenment by showing that enlightenment is myth. And I suppose if you link up scientific culture with um, technological culture, I think is justified to do, that you could read it that way. But I think that would be more Adorno style. Kassir is very much still an enlightenment philosopher uh, who, <laughs> who, who thinks of it differently. But uh, we operate with uh, technology like our 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 worldview, according to to Kassir, is always mediated through culture. Some of us may think about ourselves through the myths. The myths are the medium by which we understand ourselves. Some of it may be science. We use science as the means by which we understand ourselves. And he's and I think today one of the one of the one could say more pressing dogmas and I would say mistakes is to view the human being through the cultural product or the, the machine. To think of yourself on the model of a cultural product, namely the machine. To think of yourself like a machine. Uh, that's just another example of the way that we use products of culture as a way of understanding ourselves. Like you would in religion, you say, I am a creation of God. I'm free like God is. My freedom comes from God and I understand myself through, this, through the Genesis story. 
but actually this technological self-understanding is different, but it operates, say, culturally in a similar way. Um, one thing that I'll just say about fiction, and then I'll stop because I know we're out of time uh, here, is uh, sometimes we do talk about, I know that this isn't your point, but I'll just use the opportunity to say something. We often use myth as synonymous with story, and of course that's one meaning of it, but Kassir has this much broader and general uh, use of this term myth to signify a form of culture. And we often sometimes use myth as a shorthand for lie or deception, which Kassir thinks again is not only unjustified, but then you reduce most of human history and, and culture to lies and deceptions. Uh, and you really don't understand what it is you're critiquing anymore. Um, myths can be lies and deceptions, like in the case of manufactured myths. Um, but it's very interesting that Kassir doesn't, doesn't think about myth and fiction as synonymous per se. Um, I do think, going back to one of these other questions about uh, ideology and myth, is that Kassir, at the end of the day, thinks it is good. And in the end, uh, that it is conducive to self-consciousness, human self-consciousness, that we've transcended myth and we arrived at a scientific worldview. He thinks that this is progress, that we understand ourselves better through science. So he does think this is the case. And then the, the this again is, um, part of the progressivism of Kassir's view. And then you'd have, one could say, a basis by which you could critique not only ideology, uh, but also myth insofar as both of them somehow prevent a kind of self-consciousness. But again, this is, uh, this is straying back into this progressivist view that gets Kassir into trouble. Because on the one hand, he says myth is autonomous, measure it by its own form, not by anything else. But then he also thinks of science as the highest form of culture, and he says that. So he has, the, there, there's an inherent tension and maybe even a kind of false contradiction here where science is the highest form of culture, and yet we ought to measure myth on its own terms. And that's actually a big problem in the Kassir research is a question about whether Kassir himself can overcome that problem. And the last thing I'll say is, there are people like Sebastian Luft at uh, Paderborn now, he was at Marquette, who wrote a book on Kassir's philosophy of culture, where he says, we just have to give up on Kassir's idea that there's a vertical ordering of culture and just accept this radical horizontally. Um, but that's an open question and a problem that I don't wanna get into today. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for asking questions. Thanks for not falling asleep. <laughs>